Can everyone hear me okay? Does this sound good? If everyone could please come in and find a seat, we're gonna get started in just a moment. A couple more people, I think. Come on, Jason, find a seat. So welcome everyone. As you know, this is our first in-person Evergreen International Conference since Valley Forge in 2019. And even though it's been four years, it feels like we've been here just yesterday with everyone. So it's so great to see everyone here in person. I also wanted to re uh, welcome our first time attendees. If this is your first conference session, please do come to the registration table with any questions or if you need meal suggestions or in information on the social activities going on. We're happy to uh, help and provide information uh, about the local area. And I also wanted to welcome our remote attendees. Um, we do have, this is the first hybrid session um, conference. So bear with us. And um, we're hoping that it's a good experience for both everyone who's here and everyone that's uh, visiting us virtually. We will be recording program sessions in this room um, and in all the rooms. In this room, we'll have some live Zoom attendees. Um, so anyway, so just, just so you know. <laughs> and uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to thank our conference sponsors who make this event possible. We have three champion level sponsors, Emerald Data Networks, Equinox Open Library Initiative, and the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, also known as ECDI. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Emerald and ECDI are sponsoring um, our all conference reception tonight, and that will be held where you had breakfast um, in the pavilion tent. Thankfully, there are heaters in that tent, but if you want to bring a sweater just in case, the temperatures will go down a little bit this evening, but please do join us. There'll be a lot of really good food um, with a New England theme. Uh, Equinox also sponsored our conference badges, and you'll see their logo on all of our attendee badges, so thank you for that. We also had one advocate level sponsor, which is the Pennsylvania Integrated Library System Pales slash Spark Consortium, who sponsored breakfast this morning. So thank you, Pales. And we had six ally level sponsors, the Consortium of Ohio Libraries, or COOL, Markhive, and Kipu, who sponsored our conference snack breaks. Stat Courier, Sage Library System, and Biblio Commons, who sponsored conference IAV support, and Mobius, who sponsored Wednesday's Hackfest, and then Unique Management, who sponsored the printing of our annual report. We also have a number of exhibitors here with us today and tomorrow Bywater Solution. ECDI, Equinox, or Equinox, Library IQ, Mobius, Kipu, Shoutbomb, Solus, and Stack Courier. Everyone is encouraged to visit the exhibitor tables. They're right outside in the hallway, and um, the food and snack breaks, the snack breaks will happen in that same area. So if we could have one more round of applause for all the sponsors and exhibitors. And then I did also just want to acknowledge the members of the Evergreen Conference Committee and the local conference planning committee. And I'm hoping you'll be willing to stand up. <laughs> Sorry, all. They also have this nice light blue ribbon. No one wants to stand up. Thank you, Jason, Ruth. <laughs> I just wanted to thank all of you for all your time and efforts and energy. It has really been a team effort and a big, big grateful thanks to the Worcester Public Library. Um, hopefully a lot of you were able to get over and attend that social event and tours last night. But if you did not, um, the library is literally a two minute walk and they are open um, today until 530. So do try to make um, a trip over there if you get a chance. It's well worth it.
And then I have a couple housekeeping items. Um, hopefully most of you have found the Wi-Fi. There is printed information on the registration table. Um, and if it's the AC Hotel Conference Wi-Fi, and we have the password outside if you need it, it's easier than me trying to read it with the, with the capitalizations. Uh, we also have two spots open for the Lightning Talks today. And the Lightning Talks today focus on uh, third-party API integrations with Evergreen. So that sign-up list is also on the registration table if you're interested in giving a quick uh, Lightning Talk. The Outreach Committee has asked me to let you know that they will be sending out an email today um, regarding dates for the next Hackaway. So if you are planning on attending that, please RSVP ASAP. <laughs> Okay, now I wanted to thank all of you for traveling to Worcester to join us in person today. And the most, one of the most important things that you're gonna get out of uh, this conference this year is how to pronounce Worcester. So we are all gonna practice this morning. <laughs> Worcester is pronounced Worcester. If you need a prompt, the easiest way to remember how to say Worcester is to think of Worcestershire sauce and drop the sheer. So, <laughs> one more time. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a little nuances to the pronunciation of Worcester. If you live in Massachusetts, you may call it Worcester. So, your best Massachusetts accent, please, Worcester. And if you've lived in Worcester your whole life, you may call it Wista. So, yes. Um, so Worcester, 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 Worcester are all correct, but Worcester is not okay. Anyone caught saying Worcester during the Evergreen Conference may be publicly announced over the just kidding. Um, there are a few fun facts about Worcester. We were incorporated in 1722 and as a city in 1848, it is named after the city of Worcester in the country of Worcestershire, England. And yes, that was where Worcestershire sauce or Worcester sauce was invented. Worcester is also known as the heart of the Commonwealth, and you can see that in our logo, um, because it is the location is near the geographic center of Massachusetts, and the heart is the official symbol of the city. For nearly 100 years, Worcester was also the center of the nation's commercial Valentine's Day industry. Harvey Ball was born and raised in Worcester, and he invented the smiley face in 1963. You can find the original Harvey Ball smile face at the Worcester Public Library. We also are Wormtown, and that is a good thing. <laughs> a former radio disc jockey went by the name L.B. Worm, and he gave Worcester the nickname in the late 1970s when underground punk rock music was at its peak. Some of you may have also had the experience of trying a local brew from the Wormtown Brewery while you're here. So on that note, happy note, hearts and smiles, I do have to bring it down a notch and talk about cybersecurity. As you all know, ransomware and cyber extortion continue to be among the top cyber threats in 2023. We all need to be planning for when and not if a cyber attack occurs. And to help us do just that, I am honored and excited to introduce our keynote speaker, David Leonard. David Leonard is the president of the Boston Public Library he began working at BPL 14 years ago, and he served in the role of president since 2016. David's focus is on developing BPL as a 21st century institution that provides dynamic library experiences to the residents of Boston, of Massachusetts, and beyond. BPL has a central library in Copley Square, 25 neighborhood branches, and an archival center, and also serves as a library of the Commonwealth for Massachusetts. In his role of president, David oversees a collection of more than 23 million books, maps, manuscripts, and prints with ever-expanding digital access. 
Prior to his appointment as president, David had served at BPL as Director of Administration and Technology, Chief Technology Officer, Acting Director of Administration and Finance, and Acting Chief Financial Officer. David's prior experience spans academia and the nonprofit sector, as well as IT consulting with roles in business development, management, and technology. David is currently enrolled in a PhD program in library information sciences, and he holds a bachelor's degree in philosophy in mathematics and a master's degree in philosophy from the University College in Dublin. Hopefully that's all correct. <laughs> Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to David Leonard. Uh, thank you so much. That was more detail than I re remembered was in the, um, the, the, the bio. Um, let me get this out of the way in case I ruin my slides. A different type of security issue. Um, well, good morning. Um, it's it's good to be with you. Um, I always pretend that the R in Worcester is silent. That's my way of remembering how to pronounce it, uh, both of them. Um, and you know what I want to start with is a little admission that I, I'm not I shouldn't wander because we have Zoom people, right? So I'll have to stay over here. Um, this little admission. I'm not a librarian. Library director was never on my on my roadmap in my career, and um, I'm not an evergreen user either. So, um, so don't hold any of that against me, please. Um, but I have uh, had the privilege um, of being part of the BPLs community and our community of librarian workers here in Massachusetts. It is Library Awareness Week. Uh, we had Library Worker Appreciation Day earlier this week. So just a shout out to everybody who works in and with libraries. Thank you so much. Um, I want to set some of the stage, talk a little bit about myself, talk a little bit about BPL, and then take us back to an auspicious day in August of 2021, uh, where we were noticing um, systems stop functioning and what happened over the next few days and weeks after that. Um, I'll also have some takeaways and lessons learned, uh, but I, I generally hope that we'll get into the Q&A session uh, because I think you will have questions um, and you will have sort of uh, insights. And I think the dialogue and discussion is as important as what I, what I may have to share. Um, so hopefully we can, we can do Q&A and not leave our Zoom friends behind um, as we do that here in, in person. Um, so my background, we heard a little of that in the bio, uh, but uh, it's really a combination of the academic space, 12 years in technology, and then coming, coming to BPL. Um, and I think you know, the, that skill set might not always have been the right skill set for my current role, uh, taking over from my predecessor who hired me. Uh, but in this moment of the 21st century, having a background in research, in technology, and some experience of, of helping lead the library seems, seems to make sense. Um, digital and technology is an essential part of everything library do, does. It's not everything we do, but it's an essential part of it. Um, so um, maybe let's uh, take a moment to see who is in the room and who is in the virtual room as well. You can play along in chat if you, uh, if you can. Um, so, um, Librarians and library workers in the room, please raise a hand. Um, great, so that's the majority. You can check more than one box on this quiz also, right? So, um, so feel free. Um, technologists, okay, maybe about half. So we had about three quarters for the first question, about half for the, for the second. Consortium leaders, administrators, um, maybe about a quarter, 10% quarter, to a quarter would count themselves in that category. Uh, vendor teams, and maybe another 10% uh, and quarter. Okay, great. So, um, and that's that's obviously who we are. So, anyone want to shout out something that wasn't a category you could identify with, or do we do we cover everybody? All right, I think we did. Um, let's frame the conversation around privacy and security and libraries. Um, there is an innate tension between in our profession between providing access and wanting to do so securely. Okay. Um, second one, data. Data wants to be free. I forget whose quote this actually is. Back in uh, back back in the day, I think it was Steve Wozniak and uh, one of his colleagues that um, quoted this. 
data wants to be free. Certainly, if you look at today's uh, young people, they share data at a rate that you, 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 we would never have imagined. At the same time, data is expensive and valuable. Um, it, it is what our big social media companies put a premium on. Um, it is becoming uh, the essential component of our current economy. There is an open source and ADA, open data philosophy um, that is adjacent to libraries in much of what we do. Um, so how is that gonna play with locking everything down, putting it behind the firewall, uh, ensuring it's protected? Ah, we live in um, the nonprofit sector really, whether it's governmental or, or formally nonprofit, um, but security is expensive. To do, to do well and to do right. So just an acknowledgement of that. Not your appetite's the right, um, the right word here, but it's maybe about need. Interconnected, everything, everywhere, all at once to coin the, the movie phrase. Um, more and more of our systems, more and more of our organizations, more and more of our world. Um, I'm sure many of us have one, two, three devices, either on our person or near us right now, um, getting some smiles in the audience. So um, uh, this is adding to the complexity that we, we are forced to, to deal with. And when patrons come into our spaces or connect to us online, they're coming with all of that as well. Um, the right to privacy, at least in many of the states in the United States, is theoretically um, theoretically or actually protected in law, uh, especially as it comes to patron data and patron use of libraries, specifically historically um, collection circulation data. Um, so we've got all of that as the ingredients of the world that we are, are looking at. So there's our little symbol for a little tension going on, right? Uh, not, I'm not a graphic designer. That's one thing I am not. <laughs> um, so, so let's let's move to technology in, in our field and in libraries. Let's give us a little bit of a theory of the field around technology. Um, and so where is technology? I think of technology as being three essential components in our world. It is what runs our business. It is our business infrastructure. Um, it is our, our people soft systems. It is running our finances and it is running a very key application. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the, the ILS, right? Um, so it runs our business. Uh, without that infrastructure, we would be not able to do everything we need to do. Secondly, it is a platform uh, for service delivery to users and to patrons. It is how we distribute ebooks. It is how we distribute e-content. It is how they connect and communicate with us. So it is a platform for service delivery. I think of the first as being more internally focused, the second as being more externally focused, although nothing is simply one or the other these days. The third part essence, uh, essential component that technology offers in libraries is technology itself as a patron service. And then I break this into three, three things. To, to enable our patrons to participate in society today, they require devices, they require access and they require the skills and ability to use all of that and make sense. This is what librarians and library workers have been doing um, since the start of the, uh, the, the internet. So, so this is our technology space. This is, this is where, we, where we operate in. Um, quick snapshot before I get to the experience of our, our attack last August, what is the environment that makes up the BPL Boston Public Library? Uh, we heard in the bio, it's 25 branches, a central library. Central library is a million square feet. Um, so it's a lot of physical space to navigate. Um, we do provide along with many of our colleagues in the state, some statewide services under the Library for the Commonwealth banner. Um, our IT infrastructure runs between 100 to 150 individual server instances, things running mail, things running the ILS, things running our pay for print, things running file systems, and so on and so forth. So I just want to give you a sense of the, of the complexity and, and scale, scale or scope that we're dealing with. Um, to connect our physical locations, we run a dual fiber ring with the city of Boston, 
Um, so every location will have a redundant path connecting them to us and then us to the city and the internet. So two, which is a combination of dedicated fiber and some outsourced Comcast fiber in our instance. Our actual server infrastructure going back to August of 2021, a combination of some things physically on premise, on site in a data center in Copley, um, shrinking as you might imagine over the years, but nonetheless some there, a secondary physical location in another data center, um, some server instances in the cloud, okay? So fully deployed on the Amazon cloud or uh, VMware's cloud um, and several applications, including Biblio Commons, um, uh, hosted at a vendor, right? So uh, a combination of all of this infrastructure deployed across a number of different architectures. Our desktop environment is about 1500, uh, probably more now, combination of staff desktop, staff work, uh, laptops, public desktops, public um, laptops across the network uh, with varying degrees of management. Um, our systems are predominantly, not exclusively, predominantly a Windows server based architecture, uh, a mixture of virtual servers using VMware and a mixture of cloud and local SAN-based storage. At this time, we had migrated our backup environment from huge local tape libraries to a cloud-based system. Okay? So that, that gives you a sense of the, um, of the environment at BPL, the IT environment. Um, I draw your diagrams, do, do all those fun things, or show you diagrams that other people have drawn, but, but that's just really a list to get you up to speed with what we're dealing with. Um, great. So August, 2021, well, I would call the second year of COVID, right? We were slowly coming back to in-person work and in-person service. People were masked. We were still doing social distancing. That's, that's kind of the, the personnel environment at the time. Uh, at that point, our key IT team, a, a chief technology officer, a server team of two professionals, a network team of two professionals, and a five-person help desk team to support all of what we just described on, on the previous slide. No server manager at the time, that was a vacancy that had uh, just occurred. And we did not at this point have a dedicated security specialist, but rather those duties were spread across the other roles. So again, just setting the table around the, the personnel landscape. I told you I was terrible at graphics. So, yeah. um, so let's let's start with the the incident itself. Wednesday morning, August twenty fifth, twenty twenty one, eight a.m. Some staff calling help desk saying, "Um, having a problem logging in." IT teams in place. So, well, let's take a look at things. You know, that's that's, and then realizing they can't get to certain servers in our environment. You know, this starts to happen pretty quickly, right? This is 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour. Uh, I vividly remember I was on my way in because I live about a uh, 20 minute walk from BPL um, with my dog, Hamlet, Great Dane, three year old. He doesn't come to work all that often, but um, uh, so I was walking in, got a phone call. There seems to be a problem. We don't know what it is. Said, well, let's, I'll be there soon. And Library directors don't often get that involved in IT, but when you've been the chief technology officer yourself, you, you A, think you know better than people who've worked on the system uh, right now. And secondly, um, you have a point of pride in thinking that what you built is still working as well as it was when you changed roles. So anyway, um, specifically the diagnosis was, we're getting a non-standard blue screen of death locking out, well, not of death, but a blue screen locking people out of uh, their, their systems. Um, external email still seems to be flowing. So I got in, I had locked my workstation. I hadn't logged off. So I was able to look, look at it. I was still getting mail. I was able to communicate with people. Um, so it's like, well, this seems to be isolated. Let's, let's, uh, let's continue. Um, I say, what is actually happening here? And as more people showed up for work, more calls were coming in. Um, what's causing this, and should we start isolating? 
Um, so pretty quickly, there were enough symptoms of something. This is really a coordinated attack. These things would not be happening in this sequence um, if there was, uh, if it was just a simple, um, uh, simple issue. First, first you go to, well, is there a virus attack um, that malware is spreading, or is it something more nefarious? There you go, a little bit locker blue screen. Anyone know? <laughs> if you're familiar with that, you'll know what it is. If you're, if you're not, I hope you don't, but you probably will. Uh, so what do we do first? Um, shut off the VPN. Uh, I isolate the network. Um, so we separated all 25 branches from the central library. We basically took everything down. Uh, we shut off our internet feed and uh, we separated from the city of Boston network at layer two and layer three. Layer two is the more of the, um, the the data encapsulation layer. Layer three is where applications can talk to each other. We have very little connection at layer three anyway, uh, but out of an abundance of caution, sh shut everything down, isolate the problem, uh, diagnose and move forward, theory. Um, and then you start going, uh, what, what servers are actually affected? And uh, the next phase is going to be what will we have? What will what is recoverable? You know, do we reboot it and it's fine? Um, do we have to uh, run a patch? Do we have to restore from backup? Uh, which of these um, uh, measures are going to be necessary? And is data affected? Is this an interruption of service, or is someone actually going after our data? Um, and 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 who do we need? This is very important. Most IT professionals, including myself back in the day, was saying, I've got this, I can solve this problem, I just need a little more time. Not with these kind of conditions. Immediately go find out who, who is the cavalry that you need and who should, you, who should, you be, be, uh, who should be involved. Uh, you cannot overreact. Well, you can't overreact. You cannot overcommit resources in, in, in a situation like this. Okay, and the best model I have is you are in an emergency room, you are doing triage, you may have better analogies in your own life that work for you, but you go into that mode. This is not normal operations. Um, so library, how do we communicate to our users? Oh, we just took them off the network. Crap. Um, voice over IP is our, is our phone system. Not gonna work if you're off the network. Um, so a little broadcast text and then have managers call each location on their cell phones to basically, hey, there's a problem, we're looking into it, we'll keep you posted and go to manual mode, which means what? It means books are getting checked out and you're writing down people's barcodes and you're writing down the, the books and you'll plan to put them in later. Um, and you go to a more trusted model uh, dealing with users, um, you know, so... Um, you run, you run, and we ran the library for, for what turned out like a whole week in this mode. So yeah, voice so off. Um, so who? Um, so our own IT team, all hands on deck. Let's get in the war room. Let's map out what we know and what we don't know, and let's act. Um, the city of Boston um, has a much bigger. Um, it's city of Boston is an eighteen thousand person workforce. Um, so you can imagine what the size of their IT capabilities are. Uh, we are a department of the city of Boston, um, even though we're the Boston Public Library. Uh, so sometimes we feel like we're a little independent, but in reality, 80% of our funding comes from the city of Boston. We are a city department. So in this case, it's about leveraging those resources to help us. So they assign their security manager and one of their security professionals to come, come work with us and join our team. Um, we engaged Microsoft. Most of the clues that we had so far, this was about, this was like later in, later on the day on Wednesday, indicated it's a problem with our Windows desktops, it's somehow in our servers, it may be beyond that, um, so let's engage with the Microsoft uh, uh, team. Um, DART's an acronym. Defense and response team, that's not it, but it's something like that. It's their security response team. Um, uh, in in um, in in, uh, in in Redmond. Um, so this does appear to be an attack, right? So if it's an attack, we are a public institution. This is an attack on on municipal government. That's a serious thing. 
to involve law, law enforcement. So we had the city's CIO uh, call the police commissioner to get resources assigned. Uh, we reached out to our local um, uh, force and um, jumped to the end of this. And I've never thought I would stand in a data center with people from as many federal three-letter agencies in one place at one time. That was not on my, on my bingo card. Um, so we did have FBI, CIA, Homeland Security. Um, and what was interesting, and I'll talk a little bit about this in a few minutes, but that these people actually brought skills and resources to the table. They were not bureaucrats standing around um, second guessing things. Um, you know, our team was focused on containment and fixing the problem. The Microsoft team was focused on the forensics to diagnose what had happened, who got in where, what was the sequence that took them to be able to take down certain um, servers. And the public safety agencies were focused on, well, what other threats does this look like? Do we know who this is and where it's coming from? And, and a little more on that too. And we also brought in uh, two consultants from a consulting firm that we, we work with for infrastructure work. Um, yeah, late night, right? See, <laughs> you like my graphics more than my content, great. Um, so now what do we do? Um, what do we do? All right. Uh, was not clear uh, if we could recover uh, individual systems. Um, I'll tell you why in one second. So, the back, remember back, I said we had just migrated our backup system to the cloud using the same administrator credentials as we use to run our environment. So Wednesday, Thursday, not sure what we're recovering from, if we can recover. Well, how many items were in our collection, did we say? 20, 23 million, all the catalog records, all the circulation history, all of the patron data. Hmm. Is this a career ending situation, is it? <laughs> um. Uh, there are two principles in backup systems, uh, RTO and RPO. Um, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. RTO is how long will it take you to get back uh, if you do have to execute a recovery. Um, um, recovery point is how, when would you go back from, right? So uh, you can read about that. You should all read about that. Um, by Thursday, we knew we had a good backup from a year ago, okay? So we're, we're, we're thinking worst case scenario, right? That is better than the worst case, the true worst case scenario, right? Okay, all right, so now we know where the baseline is if we're coming back. Um, in the old days, you would have all of your data on a server or on a SAN. Um, you would have a second copy of that, maybe uh, on RAID 5 or shadowed, um, and then you would run it to tape, right? Uh, once a week, once a month. Um, and then we added something in between where we put it in the cloud at the same time. Um, the last five years, everybody's going, just put everything in the cloud, it's gonna be fine. You don't need tape anymore. You don't need local storage anymore. Maybe. Um, so, and then also trying to diagnose what was, what was, what was the actual root cause here? I have another slide on root cause, but, um, what, was this some sort of catastrophic failure? Was this malware? Was this a virus? Was this an actual attack? Um, and, and, uh, just to re-echo the point from earlier, was any data exfiltrated? Was data taken? Was patron data taken? Uh, was HR data taken? Was payroll data taken? Was financial data taken? 
All of those latter categories live in our case at the city, so they're not within our IT department's immediate control. That might not be true for other, other environments. And if you start to bring things back, is it just gonna, is there something still in your system that's gonna uh, repropagate and reinfect everything? All right, so um, Wednesday was diagnose and contain. Um, this is shorthand. Um, we deployed with the city's, uh, city team's assistance a endpoint protection system called CrowdStrike. Um, it's probably the one of the Cadillac solutions for endpoint system control. Um, Microsoft Defender in its enterprise version is very common, it's, it's fine. Um, there are others that are great. Uh, Semantic has one too. Um, uh, what this particular tool does is able to look at every single file on your system within the operating system and determine if it matches what it's supposed to be or not. So it can flag where there are um, unexplainable deviations from what things are supposed to be doing and looking like. Um, so we had a working domain controller. That was one of the saving graces here that was seemed to be unaffected because we could then start to rebuild our security uh, portfolio and our accounts and basically infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> so we went server by server with, with key things. Um, I wanted DCs back and I wanted email fully back because although external email had been flowing when we shut off the network connection, that was the end of that. Um, and so, uh, having the ability to communicate with our staff and public was important to get back as soon as possible. And then after that, we go to um, li key library systems like the ILS and pay for print and so on. Um, it turned out on Friday, uh, thanks to some clever architecture decisions early on and a very smart person on our team uh, was able to go through all of the backups realized that the hackers, and I haven't talked about the hackers yet, I will come, come to that in a moment, had um, you know, compromised servers, locked out the hard drives, installed BitLogger with an encryption key that no one had, and um, then had systematically gone through key sets of data and deleted them. So entire backup data sets deleted from the local presence and from the cloud presence. One of those systems has a shadow backup copy so that when you delete it, it's not fully gone and you can bring it back. Um, our, one of our server team was able to navigate through that and get us to a full backup from, I think maybe it was a week ago or, or, or four days previously. So phew, we're not dealing with a year ago anymore. We're dealing with just three or four days. And obviously we'd been down for two of those days. So it's really only looking at, I think, uh, a 24 or 36 hour period of lost uh, patron or production data. That, so that's the good news in this scenario. Um, did we plan that? I think to call it a good architecture decision suggests we knew what we were committing to, but did we have a run book that said, go to page three and just restore the shadow copy and you're good? No, so um, some good investment in architecture and a smart person. Um, and then we were able to proceed going back uh, by, by Sunday night. So Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, we were functional again. We did not have everything back, but we were enough. We were functional enough. Uh, forensics were going on in parallel. Um, by the following Wednesday, staff at all locations were, were fully functional with, their, with the local computers. If people had stored files, work files, personal files on their local hard drives and not in the cloud or on our SharePoint deployment or on our file server, not recoverable. Not supposed to be doing that, but when do people do everything they're supposed to, uh, even when it's policy? Um, so that was unfortunate, but not something the institution can technically be responsible for. And then um, you know, from September to October, we were bringing back uh, public desktops. Those were easy because you can just flash them all with a single image and, and, and go back. All right, root causes. Who got in where and did what? Um, people know what a zero day exploit is? 
you know, a vulnerability is discovered in a piece of software. The company tells you privately, look, we found an exploit, you need to patch this. Um, and then a couple of days later, we'll make the public announcement that this vulnerability has been uncovered and everybody should go patch. Um, the zero day is as soon as that public announcement comes out, anyone who knows what they're doing can, can attack, right? Um, so we were patching you know, every other Thursday, right? So the Monday before this Wednesday, zero day exploit announced on our VPN server technology, not a Microsoft product. Um, and the specific uh, vulnerability allowed an active account um, to access cached credentials on that system, leverage enhanced privileges, and then you jump from there to the system that it has access to, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, second point, we had discovered a contractor VPN account was still active on that system. So what I'm telling you with these first two bullets is there were two doors open. Can I, conclus con con can I conclusively say which door someone came through? No. Um, and, and this is my rule. You are only ever as strong as your weakest link, ever. Uh, in this case, there were two weak links. And so the proactive solution is fix both of them. Um, and then once you get through that link, well, then are there other weaknesses and vulnerabilities on the internal controls that then people can take advantage of? Um, so, you know, uh, who uses the domain administrator or the root account for things that they shouldn't be using it for? You know, if you you should not have more privileges for your day-to-day -day account than you need to do your job. When you're going to do something that involves the whole system or root level access, you use a different account for that. Um, most people think that's too complicated. We don't need to do that. Yes, you do. Or you go through what we went through or worse. Uh, and that was, as I mentioned earlier, also applied to the backup system. So once you, this, this individual or this group got in, got privileged access, got to a domain controller, set login scripts to install BitLocker, deploy BitLocker across the system every time something was logging in. Um, and then um, you can use that same level of privilege to take down um, uh, priority data sets. Um, so a combination of scripts to deploy BitLocker, installing BitLocker, it's an encryption tool that works on hard drives. Um, and then there was use of, a, there was evidence of a second encryption method. Um, and then there were um, some text files indicating a possible ransomware node. I never got a contact number, never got a dollar number. So I am pretty convinced that our earlier actions on that Wednesday morning actually stopped this in process. Um, as in it could have been a lot worse. Um, and the um, analysis from the logs, which were largely done by Microsoft and some of our forensic team colleagues, suggested the uh, first intrusion occurred at either mid 4 a.m., um, uh, like Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, before the symptoms started showing up between, between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. on that Wednesday. Um, so, a few technical takeaways. Something about people shouldn't have more access than they need to do their jobs. Follow the news, you might recognize that image. Um, patching and zero day exploits, pay attention to them. Even if you're mostly an open source environment, chances are you've also still got some Windows environment. Um, most of the attacks and the threat vectors go against Windows systems, not all. So regardless, take patching and zero-day exploits seriously. Um, general password management practices. Use multi-factor or two-factor authentication for everything you possibly can. Um, that is more important than the length of a password or the frequency you change it. Um, some of this is the theater of security. So multi-factor, two-factor authentication. 
um, segregating use of uh, administrative accounts. Don't use an account with more rights than it is than is necessary to do the job in question. Um, VPN firewall auditing. Um, run a penetration, hire someone to do a $10,000 penetration analysis on your network every year or two years. And read the report and take actions based on what you find in the report. Even if personnel change, especially if personnel change. Um, phishing training for all. Um, the other threat vector that we don't think was the case here, but could just as easily have been the, the opportunity uh, was someone getting a login credential uh, for someone with, uh, with, uh, with access. And this is about skills for everybody. Invest in your IT team and in your general staff. Non-technical takeaways. Communication is everything. Um, we still had a public website presence during this, uh, which is hosted uh, and separate access. So we were able to communicate to our public and to our staff. Um, you know, that, that this is essential. I, people need to know what's going on. I still have a job because I communicated through this process, not because it happened, but because of how we dealt with it and how we communicate. How you respond and pivot is as important, if not more important, than how well you are prepared. Yes, disaster recovery plans are important. Yes, backup plans are important. Yes, continuity of operations plans are important. Um, um, care for your team in a crisis. So our IT team didn't get much sleep between Wednesday and Friday. So. Uh, I didn't think they could eat that much pizza um, at once, but, uh, but, you know, like check in, you know, it's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, you know, go take a break. Um, you know, got to care for the people who are getting you through the crisis. Um, admit where the errors are. You know, so I've just given you a sampling analysis of um, things I not necessarily proud that they happened. Um, but it's a learning opportunity for us. It's a learning opportunity for others. Um, and uh, if we don't, this is how we learn. We learn from our mistakes more so than we learn from anything else. And the threat, threats have gotten very sophisticated. That's, that's the other part of this. Um, uh, call in the cavalry. Yeah, I'm not bringing in these 20 experts because you don't know how to do your job. We have a big problem to solve, so let's let's get everybody that we need. Huh. Do the after action reviews. Something goes wrong, do a debrief. Write it up so that you can pass the knowledge along. It's not like, oh, thank God we got through that. Now we let's just go back to normal, right? Um, and then monitor and revisit. Um, nothing is off the table, but know your limits. Um, if this was a request for a ransomware, do we negotiate with hostage takers? <laughs> um, every institution will have to answer this when they go through it for themselves. Um, a hospital with uh, loss of access to essential medical records may feel pressured to answer this question differently than a library would, for example. Um, so yeah, going back to three days ago with the backup, fine, I'm not gonna, yeah, not gonna negotiate, not gonna pay a ransom. A year ago, maybe I should talk to the board and see how they feel as well not recoverable at all, rebuild from scratch. You know, there, there are our principles and our philosophies and our ethics and our values and what the FBI tells you. And there is also um, pragmatic exigency. We did not engage with the attackers from presumably from 
an Eastern country in Europe that shall remain nameless. Uh, the profile was pretty convincing in terms of what our colleagues were able to tell us. Um, Um, except that something bad will happen. Even if you do everything right. Um, so I know this is called a security presentation. That doesn't make you feel very secure, right? So, uh, But I think thinking about it, understanding it, maybe accepting it, allows you to understand, A, it can happen to anyone. Um, and for us all to be staying so far ahead of what hackers, dark hat security people, uh, nefarious actors are able to do. Um, did they pick BPL for any particular reason? Probably not. We just had that vulnerability and scans indicated it was um, you know, viable. And so let's see if we can get some money. It's it's. It's it's as simple as that. So, um, okay. How are we doing on time? Um, great. Um, I want to leave you with a broader set of the challenges that we face, and then we'll open it up for uh, some questions and answers, because I've given you the overview. There's some details in there. Happy to share if you have questions. But I haven't highlighted them in the slides. Oh. So this, this concept of, the, it's not the Internet of Things anymore. It's the Internet of everything. Like my fridge is talking to, my, to me at home right now, right? So it's like um, I can watch my dog and um, feed him a treat because he's got one of those camera things. So like everything's connected. And with interconnectedness comes greater uh, concerns about data privacy and data security. Ah, we have no we had no evidence that any data packet was left the network during this attack. Also, um, there was no firewall logs that indicated any spike in um, data file transition. Nor was there. Um, and this was this is a, this is really about interruption and try and get some money. Um, so that's the good news. Um, Chat GPT, artificial intelligence, machine learning, algorithmic practices. Uh, this may be the most disruptive emergence of new technology to the library field and society in general since the start of the internet. Um, if you want to get excited and depressed about that at the same time, read Tom Friedman's article in the New York Times from several weeks ago. Um, uh, there is some opportunity here, uh, but there is also uh, more threat. The politicization of libraries. You know, if you look at the Pew and Aspen reports from 5, 10, 15 years ago, oh, we, we trust nurses and the healthcare profession, we trust the military, we trust firemen, and we trust librarians. Um, some of that trust is getting called into question, not so much because of anything we are doing, but because society itself is becoming more and more polarized. Um, many of you run networks or are part of networks. Uh, networks provide content. Uh, content is in part books, uh, and books are subject to people's opinions about what, what some should or should not be reading. So how we manage this is, uh, don't have answers on that. Ah. Yeah, just a few final thoughts. So. Um, I think data is everything um, in, in our world. You know, we used to think about land as the major component of the economy. Um, then we would think about gold or currency as itself part of the economy. Then we would think about labor as an essential part. Today's currency is headed towards where data and information are what people put a premium on. And personal data is the new currency in this world. Um, you know, Europe has clearly moved to a situation where much more regulation is in place around sharing um, of individuals' data without consent. Don't do it. Uh, the US is nowhere near that right now. Um, and we're seeing much debate happen around um, whether 
do I own my data or does Google and Facebook and TikTok? Who, who owns my data, right? Um, and if you own something, you can monetize. And if you monetize it, you have access to the levers of society. And then security is the key to data privacy. So I think, yeah, we're talking about a, a ransomware attack. We're talking about library networks, but this is in the context of a much bigger set of questions about what modern society is about. So with that, I will pause. Thank you for listening to my story and my ramblings. And and we'll have time for some questions. I'm not sure how we're doing this with uh, our Zoom Zoom friends. Do we have a roving mic or shall I just repeat the questions? Repeat the questions? Okay, stand up over here. Right, so the question is, um, how would the hackers have known how to attack our network and our, and our, and our library? Um, so um, most of these groups are scanning ranges of IPs on the internet, looking for port vulnerabilities. Um, so if you're doing a port, a VPN server, for example, has some ports exposed to the outside world. That's how you sitting in a hotel room in Worcester or uh, wherever you are in the world in Eastern Europe or wherever, um, you, you are, you are scan you're looking for a connection, right? And if you can see the connection, you can send packets to it and see what it responds with. And it, oh, it responded with this type of VPN. Oh, this must be a VPN server. I wonder if they've patched it. And then you try it. Oh God, I can get in. Uh, now let's see what I can do uh, from there. So um, that's that's really the the, the first level of um, uh, discovery in the hacker community is scanning. Um, what is available to connect to from the outside world. Otherwise, you have to come inside the network physically and, and connect to, because we don't leave ports vacant on our public network uh, environments, right? Um, so so that's, that's, that's kind of the answer to the question. In this case, that was, that was how they got in. Yeah. Yes. Um, we were, so the question one was, um, what were we running to maintain our user account database? And in a Windows environment, we were running a federated Active Directory on Windows Server 2008. Um, the second question was, with regard to endpoint security, what were we running um, internally prior to this attack where we deployed CrowdStrike as part of our defenses? Um, we were running um, a combination of uh, semantic endpoint um, um, but but that's more towards virus identification and trapping, um, not true full-on security endpoint management. So if you think you're doing one thing and that's enough, it may be solving this problem. It is not solving this other problem. Yes. Um, was this a ransomware as a service attack? Let me explain what that is to those who may not know. So there are now groups of hackers who have set themselves up as essentially MSPs, management service providers, or as perhaps we should call them hacking service providers. So basically they have a set of tools, um, possibly even a platform from which to deploy. And you as an individual hacker might come along and say, oh, I, I, wanna, I wanna make some money or I wanna attack this network or I wanna do X. Rather than build all those tools myself or be a lone actor, um, why don't I just buy service from this hacking service provider? I put in the targets, I put in what I'm interested in and have that uh, be the launch, the launch platform for it. Um, some of the characteristics of the attack in our case mirror what other organizations had seen. Um, so probably is the, the best answer I can, I can give you to that. Um, again, maybe if, if it had gone further, we would know more, but based upon what we know, it was uh, 
uh, it followed the the um, the profile and source from the same place with the same tools with the same results as as other uh, organizations had had encountered. Hopefully that answers the chat question. Another chat question. Oh, that was a thumbs up. Oh, I got I got a physical like from the back of the room. Um, is BPL part of a library consortium? Yes. We are blessed in Massachusetts to have nine automated networks for the state. Um, uh, Boston Public Library uh, is, and, is part of and runs the Metro Boston Library Network, which I think is the smallest and just has a smattering of members from, uh, 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 from Greater Boston. Um, uh, it includes uh, two other public libraries, uh, two small colleges, maybe three small colleges and schools, and then about, uh, I think, 40 of the individual Boston Public Schools library systems. Um, we manage the ILS and related functions for those other entities. Um, we do not provide any other services for those other entities. So yes, for the consortium in our case, they did not have access to their ILS data during the downtime, but none of the other systems were, were affected. Every consortium is different, right? Uh, it, both at the physical and infrastructure layer, as well as the governance layer. Yes. Right, um, a few little questions in there. Um, uh, so um, I think translating how the jargon that we use in general when we're addressing our patron or even our staff populations is essential, all the more so when technology and all of the acronyms and uh, shortcuts are involved. Um, I like trying to translate some of that into relatable analogies. Um, so yeah, like, so the VPN and, uh, you know, uh, active account, like, no, there were two doors open. Someone left the two doors open. We needed to close both of them. This is what happened, right? So some people can handle a much more sophisticated answer. Other people want an image of what's actually going on. Um, Getting communications out as soon as we could. Look, we think that there's a, first of all, yes, it's a system failure across the board, right? So, so it's that, it's a big problem. It's not just about you don't have access to connect your phone to our Wi Fi network on this day. It, it's a big problem. Second thing, it looks like we may have been attacked. People can relate to that. Um, and most people understood uh, this stuff happens. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. Thank you for all you're doing. That was more of the feedback we got then. I can't believe you let this happen to, to, to your network. Um, so, um, so, so yeah, so keeping staff informed, keeping patrons informed, keeping the board informed and keeping the mayor informed in our case. So all of those were very interesting conversations um, with, the right level of, of information and analysis to, to get, get them to know what they needed to know. Um, so in our case, um, we got more sympathy from patrons than we had criticism for patrons. Um, so I consider that a win. Um, uh, so, you know, someone comes in on, on Wednesday afternoon, I wanna use my computer. Sorry, we're having a problem. Can you come back later? Can you come back tomorrow? We're not sure when it'll be back. They come back tomorrow. It's not back yet. They're not coming back for another for another week. So there's some loss around that. Um, but 
but then you 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 put out we did a story in the globe we tell people what we did talking to all of you um so that gives us the opportunity to say hey we're back we fixed the problem um hope you'll come back and enjoy our services um let us know what you need um so that 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 approach um i i think I think works. I'm, did I forget a part of your question? I think there was another part of the end. Oh, um, that's this. See, this is interesting. Um, so we had two point one million visitors across the network in twenty twenty two. That's a huge number. We're very happy with that number. Um, some locations are as busy, if not busier, as they were before the pandemic. Uh, well, before the first part of the pandemic. I mean, it's still, the virus still exists, right? So, um, but not all locations, and we're still, um, we don't have a unified theory of why certain locations are slower to come back than not. Uh, I'm, I'm straying way off my topic, but, but, um, we've also um, seen a large amount of turnover in staff that we are still dealing with the consequences of in a hiring environment that is very competitive and very difficult. So I think part of the explanation for why some locations haven't returned to full numbers is more to do with the turnover in staff than it may be to do with, um, I'm not sure I want to be back in a physical space yet. Um, I can give you another hour on 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 that sometimes uh one more here hi yeah um yeah we did we did shut that off as well and uh so we have a segregated staff network for wi-fi and a segregated laptops only for staff laptops and a third segregated um, public open um, Wi-Fi that can't talk to each other. Um, because the infection of individual devices was caused ultimately by a login script getting triggered. Um, so as you went to your desktop or laptop or server, try to log in, you ended up getting the infected script and that's what took you down. Um, in this case, that demonstrated unlikely to happen on a on a mobile device um maybe if you have a windows does anyone still have windows phones uh, um that is logging into this maybe maybe i don't know um uh, um so uh, so the the thought process was we're isolating everything first and then when we understand what the root cause is then we decide, okay, we can turn this back on. That's that's fine. Turn this back on. That's fine. I'm not too sure about these. We need to go go for it from those. Yes, two two more, and then are we done? Or oh yeah, your request. I thought I was getting. I thought I was getting a hook, not a question. <laughs> well, go here, here, and then into. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's being present with them, but not micromanaging, not standing over them and micromanaging. Like, what are you doing there? So, so I think um, it's because it is a serious matter. You know, you want people on on deck and doing things. Um, I, I think uh, we did group sessions. Um, so you weren't always on the computer trying to work out what was going on. You're doing group sessions, whiteboarding things out, what's connected to what, if this happened, could this also have happened? So, so I think it's time to, it was time to, I am sorry. It varied during the day as well. First of all, it was about what's going on, contain the problem. Now that it stopped spreading, whatever it is, now how do we go forward from here? So you pace yourself for this. Um, you make people take breaks. You make people eat, um, and then you know some of the time you're you're you you, you want to research an idea that you have. Maybe this data set is safe because we did a 
training server dump of our ILS database two weeks ago. Maybe I need to see what condition that's in. So you're, you're giving people space to pursue leads, but at the same time, once you have a plan, um, and I think the, so the email was interesting because we, as I said, we were still getting external email until we shut the network off. Um, uh, which meant that some of the messaging systems were up and others because they're pure Windows systems where some mailboxes live and other li lives over here, something's up and something's not. So, okay, let's bring in our Exchange, Microsoft Exchange expert, let them take care of that. So you're also um, distributing tasks um, so that people can deal with what they can deal with. You don't want anyone overwhelmed in that situation. That's probably the... Um, the the key takeaway is I just reflect on on your on your question um and then you know how far do you how long can you work what's what's a reasonable day that you can work and um how many of those in a row can you do you know different people would answer those differently um but if you don't pace it by the time you come back on Monday you're either going to be exhausted and useful useless um, or you start making mistakes or misdiagnosing problems. So, in in so I, I don't have a I don't have a magic formula for this, um, but those are the factors that I feel I as the leader wanted to pay attention to, um, and listen. Let 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 people guide you. Like, hey, I need a break. Fine, go go home. You know. Um, um, our chief technology officer had decided to move on already, um, and so that 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 did that did occur. Um, he actually stayed with us on contract to to keep a few things um, taken care of. Um, I think one of our staff members felt terrible uh, that 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 they had somehow let this happen. So that required a little bit of work to say, look. <laughs> <laughs> these people out there are 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 so smart and will find even the smallest sliver of an opening to to go in and do do something nefarious and damaging. And, and by the way, weren't you the one that found the backup from the the two days ago that was in, in a re completely recoverable position? So you got to build someone up in, in that situation. So um, um, and then it's really about look how do we how do we do our best to make sure something like this can't happen again. Um, I now have a cybersecurity person on my staff. That was, oh, you know, oh, who was it? Was it Rahm Emanuel who, who used this phrase, never waste a crisis? Um, so we went and got a budget allocation in the next budget cycle for a security person on our IT team, uh, which I think we're only now about to fill, actually. Um, uh, and we've had, um, I don't think we've added positions necessarily, but we've had a little turnover um, just in the natural course of things. And um, uh, I think we have some newer skills coming to the table that are that feel a little bit more current in, in the aggregate, not about any individual, but in the aggregate, it feels like the team is a little bit more um, skills skills based. Um, so, uh, we, uh, there's some functions within the Microsoft systems you can just turn on and use, um, in other cases for our IT team, we wanted something a little more robust because there's, you know, if this account gets compromised, there's extra vulnerability. Um, uh, at a minimum, do you get an email that asks you to confirm you are the person you say you are? So that's the simplest version of two-factor authentication. And then you can go all the way to, um, you know, send us your thumbprint or um, 
take your eyeball out and put it on the machine or I, we're not doing that. Um, uh, but you know, a text message that that is an app on an authentication device. So we've turned on some of that as well. Um, I, I think it's about knowing what is enough to meet the security standards that you're setting, but not so much that it either overwhelms people or makes them find a workaround. Two more hands, front and then back, or back and then front. Ah, oh, um, um, no. Um, uh, in hard costs, you know, we did pay the Microsoft security team for their expertise. So that was a consulting engagement. Um, uh, that was tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, there was overtime for our staff during that one week period and beyond. Um, um, the additional licenses for, uh, you know, we, we used CrowdStrike everywhere for um, a trial period and then went to something something else. Um, I think we actually shipped it to the, the um, I think we have, I think we have CrowdStrike on our servers now, but we have something else on our desktop. So, uh, so there's some license costs in that. Um, but that's all I got for you. The, the loss of service to patrons, I'm never sure how we put a number on that. And, you know, you, you do that in the private sector, you, you can calculate your, your loss very, because uh, it's, all, it's all on spreadsheets, but, but it, I, qualitative impact on patrons' lives, very difficult to put a, um, put a number on that. Um, um, I think it's a valid question, uh, but the, the societal value is kind of more of the moral um, impact of this. If you want to ever read more about that, look at Michael Sandel's book on what money cannot buy. Um, now I've just gone down a whole other tangent, sorry. Um, um, yes, but not robustly because um, in, in many cases, being part of a large entity like the city means that we're effectively self-insuring. The cost of a policy for an entity of that size would be so um, astronomical, it's, it's, it's better to actually have an allocation that you know you're going to tap into. So it's like self-insuring. Um, much more complicated uh, question, I think. Uh, for other organizations, yes, seriously look at that. But make sure you know what you're getting um, because you don't want a scenario to pay for an insurance service that's really just going to pay off the ransomware attackers should that occur. That's actually not ideal in my mind. What you want is a policy that will allow you to engage with the experts to come in and work with you on the situation. Yes. Um, we believe in this case, uh, the purpose was not to get you information. It was not to, um, it was not to, oh, I've got all your social security numbers. I'm going to make you pay me for that until, until, uh, and then I'll, I'll destroy them or give them back to you or sell them to somewhere else, someone else. Um, it, it was much more, I am going to disrupt your systems so that you will pay me money in order to return to normal operations. But, but it could equally have been the other question from Zoom via the back. Uh, call me afterwards. Uh, um, I, I think, I think uh, it depends on the size of the network and the complexity of the environment you're managing. Um, I think it depends on what other resources you have access to. Are there uh, retired IT professionals in, in your community? Are there volunteers? Are there colleagues you can um, connect with? Um, uh, come to an evergreen conference and connect with your peers around support. Uh, I think this is an area where um, I've observed our IT teams are often not the ones naturally going to share best practices and concerns with IT teams from other institutions. I think we as a profession should be facilitating more of that. 
specifically to try and help those who have have fewer resources. Um, uh, but again, I think this is that's a context dependent question, actually. So it really depends on what you what you're what you're trying to accomplish. But um, uh, try not don't do it alone. Basically, is the is the bottom line on that. Um, uh, so even if you are a team of one, uh, let's get creative about finding other ways to connect with other other peers in other places. All right, maybe this will be the last question. Yes. What data is collected? Uh, no. No, um, it has not. Um, I think um, that we have a kind of a separate initiative we're hoping to kick off next year to look at um, uh, you know, what data should we be collecting? What, what data do we need about patrons? Um, what data have we not collected traditionally, but would be nice to know about on an opt-in basis? And then how do we manage and disaggregate, um, uh, de-identify basically um, all of that data that we do have, whether it's must have or, or optional opt-in uh, need to have. Um, not as a result of this of this incident, but more because of other other um, interests and concerns. Um, you know, the philosophy of libraries has always been to only collect the absolute bare minimum of you need to provide someone service. So, because that's about protecting their their confidentiality, their situation. Um, the um, inhibiting factor is we don't often know about why someone is coming to us for a particular service or thing or what impact it has on their life. We don't in introduce more barriers that would prevent people from coming to us or trusting us, um, but it would certainly be nice to be able to know more about who we're serving and, and how it, what it means. Um, so stay, stay tuned would be my, <laughs> my, my real answer on that, but not as a result of this, of this incident. What it does say to me is that, um, you know, if you're in danger of falling behind um, the hacker community, uh, because we, we do have patron data that we care deeply about, we must double down on staying up to speed on what the current threats are. Well, I think um, we're almost at 1030. So thank you for all your questions and being an engaging and friendly evergreen audience. Um, thank you, enjoy the rest of the conference.